Welcome to the Black Sparrow Media Internet Broadcast Network. Listening to Linux in the Hamshack. LHS is a podcast about Linux, open source, and amateur radio for everyone. Now, here are your hosts Russ, K5GUX, Cheryl, W5MOO, and Bill, NE4RD. Well, hello everybody and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 516 of Linux in the Hamshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. Episode number 516. If you didn't know our formula coming in is a deep dive episode. This is where we go in depth on a particular topic. Could be ham radio related, could be Linux related, could be both. You never know. In this particular case, it's a little bit of both. So that's excellent. But before we get into it and introduce our guest for this evening, we will introduce ourselves. Cheryl, W5MOO, is not going to be with us yet again. Hopefully that will change here in the near future, but uh, for the moment, no go. In the meantime, I'm Russ, K5TUX. And I'm Bill, NE4RD. So we do have a guest, an interviewee tonight who's going to talk about something we talked about in episode number 513, which was our last deep dive, and that deep dive was on Dragon OS. So we happen to have, by sort of a weird coincidence that I guess Bill can tell you about, the the uh, creator of Dragon OS, which we have since come to learn, his name is pronounced Sema Executor, which I thought I might have hit accidentally, but probably didn't. Um, he's also got a real name. His name is Aaron. So let's go ahead and bring him on and, uh, say hello, Aaron. How are you doing tonight? Hey, thanks for having me on here. Uh, appreciated the, uh, podcast about Dragon OS. And so it's nice to be on here and answer any questions. So thank you. Well, good. I'm not sure what questions there are going to be. That's sort of uh, where Bill is going to take over and lead this interview for tonight, since he came across you in, uh, I think, a YouTube video and sort of put a couple of things together. And since we had recently done a Dragon OS deep dive, this seemed like a great follow-up. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and let Bill take over, and um, we'll see where we go from here. Yeah, absolutely. So, Aaron, uh, why don't you uh, give us a little background on yourself? I know you sent me a little bio information, but uh, if you can just uh, wrap it up for uh, our guests here, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, how you got interested in Linux and you know, possibly SDR. And, uh, yeah, let's start with that. Uh, yeah, I guess a little bit about myself. Uh, I think I had mentioned what I had sent over kind of from a little town. Nobody had really heard of it until the... Uh, train blew up in the in the back uh yard there of uh east palestine ohio so everyone seems to know about it now um since moved on from there though kind of in the georgia area and uh with what covid a few years ago or so uh, it seems like anyways uh i wanted to take that time uh, that i had kind of sitting around and um make a distribution that I felt would help people with software defined radios because I just kind of got into it myself with the RTL SDR of all things, um, hack RF and, and some other software defined radios. So, um, when I'm not doing that, I kind of do some hardware and just software development. Uh, and, and like I said, most of my spare time, if I'm not outside running around or, or, you know, doing something outdoors, it's seems to be recently, uh, just trying to further, uh, dragon OS. So, I think it about sums it up. Yeah, excellent. So, uh, so you, you did take a time to uh, actually listen to our podcast uh, <laughs> that we uh, deep dived and uh, and slaughtered your uh, your handle there several times. Uh, so, uh, what did uh, what what do you think we uh, touched on properly, and what what surprised you the most about uh, the coverage of uh, Dragon OS from at least our perspective as as ham radio guys? Yeah, so I, I'm not a real big podcast listener, but uh, I eventually figured out how to you know get it pulled up, and I accidentally I, I think I had started it about halfway in where I think you guys were butchering my name <laughs> or my handle, and uh, uh, 
I think you got on to talking about Mary DB or something, but I, I, I was having a, a blast listening. I rewinded it all the way to the beginning and, um, and listened to it from the beginning. So it was really kind of my first time listening to you guys. Uh, I think I learned that, uh, I, I didn't fully have everything ham related covered. It, it, I'll be honest. I didn't start out, uh, really what I think anything or much of anything ham related and, you know, some people reached out to me and, and asked, Hey, could you include this? Could you include that? And so the, the ham radio list of applications kind of grew. And if you had noticed, uh, some of them I've, uh, essentially built from source, uh, you know, kind of went beyond where, uh, 22.04 has, uh, has the packages. If you were to go via like a, you know, an app install, so I try to carefully update some things. I actually run a, a PPA um, up on GitHub that I can push out, you know, applications, um, some ham related. And then uh, what, what, I forget what else you had asked, but I've learned that something about logging. You guys had said something about logging, which I thought was interesting because I swear I learned about some logging application for WSJTX. I thought I had it included in there, but I don't know. You got me thinking. I'm 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 missing quite a few things. It seems like ham related. Oh uh, yeah, we have a we have a certain application that uh, generally uh, has problems <laughs> running on various distributions, primarily because uh, MariaDB is not installed by default, or in some cases, uh, the permissions are messed up via App Armor or what have you, to where the user can't instantiate uh, readable database files within the user space, um, which is quite common for databases to not operate with user space uh, files. Uh, so, yeah, so that was MariaDB. And uh, you had uh, mentioned that you had MariaDB installed on there for another application called uh, what, Crocodile Hunter or Alligator Hunter. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a crocodile hunter. Uh, absolutely nothing to do with a uh, ham radio. It's more for using a software to find radio, uh, essentially to find what they call like uh, fake base stations, uh, stingrays. Uh, there's a whole GitHub page about it. I thought it was pretty interesting, and so that's why I had that database on there, which I had to learn all how to get that worked out and get it running. But it sounded like in the process of your show, you you guys kind of wiped that all out. And, and uh, changed it out with something else. Or, so I have to figure that out. Yeah, when we went to install our, our logging application uh, that well, at least I use uh, regularly, which is called CQR Log, uh, it, uh, it wants to install a dependency uh, of uh, normally um, in most distributions, it's MariaDB properly. Uh, but uh, unfortunately with uh, Ubuntu, it tends to install MySQL. And in this case, because I believe the Crocodile Hunter possibly was manually compiled or whatever, there wasn't actually a depends that prevented the uninstallation of MariaDB. And it, it subsequently took out MariaDB <laughs> when we added a, a CQR log. Uh, but I did add it back, and then I, I tried messing around with the uh, CQR log application, and it uh, don't recall it uh, working properly. But, yeah, that's neither here nor there. That, I expect that to fail every time in general. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying out some distros today and uh, had some uh, various uh, various experiences with it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I understand. Uh, I understand with using the LTS, it does have sort of uh, a, a bit of a staleness or a uh, delay in getting any new versions of stuff to it. And uh, you know, having your own PPA probably helps a little bit to for people to subscribe to that and get updated packages. Uh, are those PPAs installed on the Dragon OS? Is that how you uh, propagate updates to that? I had, uh, for a while, just left it, like, optional. I left it on the user, t you know, if they installed and they happened to, you know, read the directions. or, or I, I don't even know if I put it on the, now that I think about it, you got me thinking about it. I don't even know if I have it up there anywhere where it tells people to go to the PPA, now that I think about it. Maybe I'll talk about it in a few videos, but I, in the most recent ISO, I think I just went ahead and put it, you know, turned it on by default. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes. <laughs> I'll have to look at the latest install just to look at it. Um, but uh, yeah, that would be a, a great way to keep uh, keep things updated, at least when running in the PPA or well, in, in an LTS environment where, yeah, I mean, we're getting ready for a new LTS in about, uh, what, six months or something like that, uh, seven months. So <laughs> we'll be a whole new, whole new, uh, whole new platform 
uh, and different versions and, and different dependencies as soon as that comes around here. So I'm assuming that uh, that with all the interest in SDRs, I was I was going through some of your, your videos and I see you mess around a lot with uh, GNU radio and building your own radios and stuff like that. Um, I find that, that very interesting because that's something I've never really got into with uh, with uh, that stack. You know, I've used utilities built with uh, GNU radio, uh, but maybe you can uh, expand a little bit about uh, what, you're, what you're doing now and, and kind of uh, some of the things you've demoed uh, with uh, GNU radio and uh, on, on your Dragon OS platform. Yeah, you you kind of. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, I know. I think I think most recently, actually. Um, so back to the train thing, the train blowing up in East Palestine. There, I I when I was back there, I was actually interested in. Well, what kind of signals did the trains give off? But everything was kind of busy when I had visited then, so I didn't get around to it. But more recently, I was uh, kind of staying. Well, really, yeah, like in a hotel. I look out the window. There's train tracks. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and I had all my SDRs with me. Uh, of all things, the RTL SDR4. And I don't know. I just had time kind of sitting there, and I thought, well, let me look into what trains give off. And then that's when I start learning about head of train, uh, end of train. You know, the, the the EOT, it's on the back of a train, kind of replaced the caboose. I, I don't know. I went down this rabbit hole, learned all about that. And those uh, devices there give off, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're transmitting. So I just... Uh, Use the GNU Radio Flow Graph. I think you can find it. It's a GitHub repo, uh, PYEOT, I think it is. It was a very simple uh, flow graph. I just had to change a few things for GNU Radio 3.10, tunes to a certain frequency that the EOT uh, transmits on. And that was receiving, I think it had a ZMQ block, I think, in there that it pumped out. And then there was a Python script accompanying it. Uh, and a really, actually, if you go watch it, a very interesting uh, DEF CON talk where the guy i i was one of the best defcon talks that i or that i really enjoyed watching and he uh basically decodes what the the train is given off and so there's just some very generic information like uh you know is the train moving is there uh, some uh, battery statistics and and things like that uh that that's you know i'm i kind of do a lot of GNU radio flow graphs just like trying to teach myself certain things but that's the most recent thing i can think about uh as far as doing a uh, a video on and sharing it with people i guess yeah i was looking at uh you did one too that involved uh doing some uh must have been something across uh uh tail scale or something like that too i was looking at some networking stuff you were you were working on passing traffic back and forth using your, oh. your private network oh yeah okay yeah wow how did i forget that yeah uh Wait a minute! Now, you, now you got me thinking. Oh, digital. Uh, what was it? NRSC five. NRSC five. Digital. Yeah, uh, yeah. The radio stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. So digital radio. I saw that the project had been um, updated uh, since I had put it into Dragon OS, and I thought, oh, let me take a look at this. And I noticed that he had uh, the you know developer or or the on GitHub there had like some blocks where you could. You could change what was it the artist and the title info, and you can push out like album art uh, over digital uh, radio. And so I thought, oh, well, how do I make this more interesting? So, you know, tail scale, free service, VPN like service. I thought, well, I have my uh, uh, little. It was an older Intel NUC. I actually intended the video to be about this uh, pretty pricey uh, Epic SDR. It's in a mini PCIe form factor. Typically comes, I think, with like some proprietary um, firmware or something on it. Uh, I made an open source uh, firmware for it. Uh, it's essentially like a, it's like the Pluto SDR chipset, but in a mini PCIe form factor. And I intended to do everything with that. Well, I don't know. I got sidetracked. Something didn't work right in the flow graph, so I switched over to the HackRF, and then I had the Intel NUC with the HackRF with the NRSC5 and the flow graph that you saw generating the uh, digital radio uh, signal, and then if I recall, I think again, I think I had the RTL SDR V4. I think was the receiving the end. Yeah, yeah, that's right. See, this is all tying back to the RTL SDR4. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I had it receiving, and let me think. I had it receiving, and I think I had the uh, NRSC5, the decoder. That's what it was for the RTL V4 and the uh, GUI 
that basically just uses that binary. And I had it listening to the station. I think I verified it was running. I started decoding, receiving it. And then I used the, the tail scale VPN that I had on both my desktop and the remote end, uh, essentially just to push a different uh, album art over to that remote, I guess you'd say remote transmitter, and then verify that I, on the local end, uh, did get that new album art. I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah, it was it was very interesting because you got to go watch you kind of build and then you stop the video and got a troubleshot it and you came back and, <laughs> and everything else. It was uh, it was very interesting. So I mean that that just I mean we'll mention it at the end of course, but like yeah, if you if you all are interested in some very uh, very interesting kind of design stuff, uh there's a lot of good stuff in your in your channel there and you can uh, just search up uh, Sema Executor on YouTube and find his channel. So uh yeah, I definitely uh, recommend that. So well, let, let's uh, circle back to uh, you, you were talking about DEF CON. So uh, you'd mentioned to me on the phone earlier that uh, that uh, you were surprised at some of the feedback you got uh, when you went over to like the Ham Ham Village and the RF Village and stuff like that. Can you maybe share your experience of uh, DEF CON with us, uh, being uh, the creator of Dragon OS? Yeah, that's a good that's a good topic. I had never been to one before. Uh, I had the opportunity to travel down there. I had some uh, people that I know in the RF, uh, yeah, the RF village. Uh, am I saying that right now? You got me thinking RF. Yeah, it's RF village, I think. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm sorry. Jeez, well, I'm going to make sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, mainly because they, they helped me out with uh, getting in there and, and, and a badge and, and, and everything else. And I spent most of the time there kind of helping with that um, capture the flag event uh, that they do. And met some really interesting people. I I think on Twitter or whatever it is now X. I mentioned that uh, hey I'm here or whatever I said, and some people came and actually uh, linked up with me. And you know I thought that was pretty cool. But at one point I think it was maybe the second day or so. I thought oh I got to go down to the Ham Radio, so the Ham Village here, Ham Radio Village. And uh, I go down there and I'm looking around and I see. I see a, I, I see a pretty much like Windows computers. I see everyone on Windows computers. Maybe there was like a, a Linux computer here or there. And I, f- I finally said, hey, uh, I went up to someone and I said, hey, you ever, you ever heard of Dragon OS? You know, he's behind the counter there. And he just looked at me like I was crazy, like he'd never heard of it. And I thought, oh, wow. I, was, I tried to start explaining it. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I couldn't find anyone in there that heard of it. I thought, well, I guess I'm in the wrong place or I, I haven't said enough about ham radio to have it recognized here wow that, that's very surprising <laughs> um yeah yeah i mean i think we had mentioned it uh russ can probably search and find it but i think we had mentioned dragon os like probably last year sometime when when we stumbled upon it so it hasn't been completely in obscurity if we've already uh, we've already seen it a, a few times so um yeah that's that's very that's very interesting that uh, you had a Kind of a, a cold response from the ham radio community. You figure there would be a lot more Linux users and, and definitely some Pi users and stuff like that that you know have definitely well, traversed the Pi areas. In all fairness, now I'm kind of remembering it. It may have only been like one or two people. I do. I, I better be careful here because I do remember someone coming to the RF uh, uh, area there and actually coming up and 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 meeting me and that. I remember now they mentioned they were from the ham radio village, like down in that area. So I, okay, I better be careful there. I think it was just maybe like one or two people I approached, uh, but I do remember someone coming and seeking me out and, and shaking my hand. And I, I, I can't remember the name, but uh, I, I do now that we talk about it a little bit more, remember that. <laughs> okay. We won't, we won't put anybody, uh, you know, in trouble. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, we had uh, we'd mentioned uh, what we mentioned it back in twenty is that twenty twenty us that was mentioned the first time. Yep, October of twenty twenty. So it's been a bit. Yeah. So yeah, we kind of stumbled upon it then. So that was it probably in its infancy, right? So when did Dragon OS actually start? Uh, you know what I recall kind of first starting with uh i actually was using just straight debian i remember debian 10 i think if i go on source forge you look at dragon os 10 i think it's called and that's where i i was using debian and and then i kind of figured out a, a better way to make the iso there was some reason I, I i felt the need to switch to ubuntu or well lubuntu i was trying to keep the uh, installation small so that i could yeah. jam more stuff in there and then um, I think we kind of joked about it earlier. I 
you know, went to 20.04 focal and then 22.04 comes out. And I'm thinking, well, what the heck am I going to call this? I don't want to change my source forge page because I've built up, you know, all these downloads. I don't want to make an, another page, Dragon West Jammy. So I said, well, I'm just going to throw an X on the end. and But then that confuses people because you, you're going to the Dragon West focal page, and, but you're downloading Jammy and, you know, whatever. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely caught uh, caught Russ at the beginning because I had to correct the the notes when we started that show. It's like, no, it's it's not it's not focal fossa. It's it's jammy. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, we picked it up uh, off of the article that uh, Brian uh, Brian Cockfield wrote on uh, Hackaday. I think that's where I originally uh, found Dragon OS. So uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where we found it back in 2020. So yeah, that's that that's great that it's sort of. Uh, been around this long and and it continues to grow and get better and better yeah and it's uh interesting that you mentioned uh, brian's name because that was the i think you go on there and you provide tips or provide somehow you can get your story on there and i saw him having written a uh something about software defined radios and i eventually like emailed him and said and that's who i've typically went to like hey you might be interested in this and he seems always very receptive and and nice and and uh next thing i know there there ends up an article on hackaday i'm like oh wow that's really that's really nice yeah absolutely i mean you got to propagate it out right so (laughs) uh just definitely uh definitely uh definitely helped the uh the noise level with that um so let's talk about some of the cool things that you have running dragon os i see uh you have uh listed here the dragon deck which i think you've have featured in several of your videos and definitely some of your pictures on uh, your uh your x or twitter or whatever it's called this week uh platform uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about your uh, your dragon deck and your uh, your well dr- your war dragon. I think that's what you have there too. Uh, yeah. So the I have a Valve Steam Deck, and you know, of course, it kind of comes with whatever flavor of Linux is on it. I I honestly I think I've only turned it on to, twice to to that. Not not that there's anything wrong with it. I just didn't have a lot of time to play video games. It's since essentially wiped and. Uh, and I don't use Windows that much, but I will admit I have it dual. I have it partitioned uh, in such a way where there is a Windows section there. I used it to. Uh, I can't remember why I used it, but it primarily just runs another uh, Dragon OS install. And uh, most recently, with the new ISO and and Ubuntu 22.04 switching to that 6.2 kernel, that brought along uh, the support that I needed to have audio at least out of the box working out of the uh, the audio jack. There's there's like a four or five weird steps that I got to mess with to have the audio come out of the, the speakers. Uh, other than that, I, I remember you guys had mentioned SDDM. Well, it's funny with the uh, Steam Deck, I realized, and if you guys have a, a solution to this, let me know, but the keyboard is so goofy on SDDM. Like when you add it, it's like takes up the whole screen. It's a pain in the butt. But GDM3 has a nice little <laughs> like keyboard, like for the, uh, you know, so if you had to like touch screen and log in, it's up, up in the upper right hand corner. So I'll typically install GDM3. And then before logging in, bottom right hand corner, I just say, hey, you know, log into Lubuntu one time and it just saves that. Uh, and then what else? There's another weird thing where if you rotate the screen to landscape, yeah, landscape, um, the touch screen uh, is out of whack. So there's another little X rotate script or whatever it is that, that fixes that. So after about four or five post installation st- steps, then it's it runs pretty well. Like Almost you know, bearable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I have like one of these little Windows tablets from, I don't know, the Windows 8 days that is basically the same thing. You had to like put all the extra uh, configuration in it to keep it from rotating the opposite direction of the screen when you rotate the device. It was like, why is it going the other way? Uh, Of course, I had Fedora Fedora on there, so it was already GDM in it and the touchscreen works fine on it. So, yeah, that is one of those weird things. SDDM is just sort of... uh, I mean, maybe Russ can pipe in. Russ, you want to say anything about SDDM? I think you you made some comments and references to to it. I, I did. I don't exactly know all that much about the desktop managers and you know the login stuff. Where where it comes for me is for 
pre-launching things before the desktop environment is up. And, you know, I don't, I don't really worry about the, any of the features as far as what, what you're presented for the login screen. So I can't really offer any. Oh, you were trying to get barrier running. That's right. Wasn't that it? Yeah. But I, uh, but I try and get it running before login. The, the idea being that you can actually use the SDDM screen to log in from a remote computer, which is sometimes problematic. If you, if you have to log in first, then your IPKVM is kind of useless, if you know what I mean. So, yes. But, uh, yeah, that, that's where I was with that. Yeah. So, essentially, with the Dragon Deck, you have a portable Dragon OS environment on a quite capable little portable computer, which I think most people, when the Steam Deck came out, realized this uh, quite early on and have either uh, done full desktops and, and whatever on there. And I believe the uh, Steam OS or whatever they're calling it, uh, the application is it's an arch based distribution that actually runs on there uh which which is is pretty capable in itself but obviously highly customized for the uh the steam the steam interface but uh so you make this you take this uh, dragon deck around with some uh some your hack r f and some other gear and kind of set up little portable uh s d r environments uh to do some stuff remotely then right yeah that i mean that pretty much hits it i i think uh more recently, well, like yeah, essentially at DEF CON, I I took an antenna array that was um, well actually made by somebody else, uh, uh, somebody I know, uh, provided an antenna array uh, that was designed for the uh, Kraken SDR. So essentially five RTL SDRs inside that that Kraken SDR for direction finding, and I. I felt somewhat goofy, but I, I walked downstairs in the hotel and I'm walking around with this Steam Deck in my hand, a backpack with a, with, uh, a direction finding antenna array sticking up above my head and uh, kind of got some attention there. I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, that's that's great. I think that's one of the pictures you uh, you shared on your Twitter profile or X. I keep calling it Twitter. Oh well, it's it's Twitter still, right? It says Twitter dot com. Um, yeah, that looked great. So what's the uh, what's the War Dragon you mentioned? Uh, that's kind of like building upon. I had just you know you see all these cyber decks and and you know the little pelican boxes or some after you know whatever other type of box. So I just tried to put something together. Uh, actually, the reason why I switched to this little box in a particular computer was because uh, there's another individual on uh, on X, uh, the Bald Geek. And so he's really big into um, all things aircraft related, in particular, uh, Iridium. Uh, so like ACAR, or uh, I'm probably saying this right now, I'm thinking about it. Uh, ACARs? ACAR, ACARs, I think it is. Whatever it mm. is. So like GR Iridium, there's... Um, uh, you can use, you know, software defined radios to, to pull out the aircraft information and to get all of it to like run an air spy. Um, you need, you need some power. Like there are the, 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 the raspberry Pi four, great little board, but it's just not going to, you know, it's just not going to handle this 10 mega samples per second and, and, uh, bandwidth. So, you know, I thought, well, you know what, I've got these little boxes I'm trying to build. Let me research and, uh, ended up, I'll go ahead and share it on here. You know, if you, if you look up, uh, even on like something like Amazon, you can find these Intel 12th Gen uh, N95, uh, N100, you know, N95 is the particular one I get. It's the processor. Mm-hmm. These small PCs are only like, I don't know, by the time you get them on sale, maybe you're looking at 150 bucks or so, something like that. They come with Windows. Um, but what's crazy is, uh, you know, after uh, basically pre-installing Dragon OS on them, I do some post configurations that I can't really uh, do with the, uh, the ISO, you know, so I personally go and I test it all and I configure it all. Well, put it together with an air spy and then sent it out uh, to the ball geek, you know, before I put these on, on my website and uh, had him, you know, run through. And I think he was getting like 6,000 something. I forget what the particular number is. I think messages through this thing is just crushing it. This, this little box. And, um, and so I get it back and yeah, I've ran, you know, everything I can think through it uh, at pretty high, like even the Lime SDR, Blade RF and for, and for the cost, uh, yeah, it just like kills it. So anyways, I put them together, um, probably more, I'm probably going to switch to maybe just having them like the computer itself to keep the cost low, pre you know, pre-configure it, um, or I may still, you know, put it inside a little box and I have a little uh, 3D printed um, carrying assembly that goes in there. And, and I, I try to just, hey, here you go. If you plug it in, um, you should be good to go, uh, basically. 
Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's, <laughs> that's nice to see a project like that coming together. <laughs> so you also have a, a Pi version of Dragon OS, which we haven't really played with, uh, mainly because I don't know where my last working Pi is, but <laughs> most of them have gone thermal in their lifespans. Um, so what's the what would be the big difference between the Pi version and the and the current? I guess the Focal X version. Sure. Uh, I try to keep them very similar. So the Pi version is also running 22.04, just the Arch 64, you know, version. Um, think of, you know, changes. It actually does have the GDM. I, I think for some reason, I'm trying to remember it, I think it does have the GDM3 login. It does have a, uh, I heard you guys mention this, it does have a hard coded user of Ubuntu password dragon, you know, obviously recommend change in that password at least um comes with real v i heard you mention that just because there's a, you know essentially a pi version uh and it and it works well on uh, even though it's ubuntu and not raspberry pi os um and then i tried to the be- as best i could uh put the same applications uh, there may be a few differences uh where it kind of started with the pi version was a um i was going to have like a headless uh kind of like I don't even know, like an extension of the desktop. Like, so this thing that would be out there and remotely do things and, and send back to the desktop version. But then people wanted all this stuff on uh, the Pi. So I just, you know, I added to it and now, you know, you can run it. um, You can, you know, run it headless if you want, stop the desktop. It has like SDR plus plus, and you, maybe you all are familiar, you know, SDR plus plus has a, a server aspect to it. Um, kind of like uh, sig digger has a server aspect to it so if you just wanted to run your sdr remotely somewhere the pi could do that and then feed back to your um sdr plus you know plus plus like gui on the desktop um mm. or sig digger you know things like that yeah speaking of like sig digger because that's one of the applications i i actually never ran into before until i saw it on dragon os what are some of the other applications that uh, people would find on there that might be a little bit more, you know, let's say, esoteric or something like that, uh, that you probably wouldn't run across, but uh, you find is a very useful tool set? Mm. Uh, well, well, okay. So, well, Sig Digger, I, th- I think something really uh, unique about that is um, that I think is different than all the other applications for the most part is it has a server aspect. And I've only really talked about it like, you know, once or twice or so, but Sig Digger, uh, well, actually the, the developer of that uh, I've, you know, communicated, uh, via, you know, X and Twitter and, and, and email even, I think over, uh, qu- like a couple years actually. And I, I try to, uh, you know, give ideas and he's a, a very, uh, receptive and, and, you know, has changed a lot of things in Sig Digger. But anyways, the remote portion of Sig Digger can run in such a way where all the digital signal processing happens on the uh, remote end so you have to consider that you know make sure you got some power behind whatever's doing that but then when it sends back uh, to your um, GUI sig digger you know on your on your desktop it's very minimal bandwidth it's just, it's just sending uh, essentially the updates for the FFT and if you've demodulated audio it sends that back whereas uh, other things like um, let me think SDR plus plus or like say RTL uh, TCP uh, mm-hmm. sends that whole stream back uh, quite a bit of data over and then has you doing the digital signal processing locally. So that that's kind of a, a, a difference there. And, um, oh, gosh, I don't know. You put me on the spot. I'm trying to think of uh, anything else that's uh, unique. Uh, get, I mean, there's oh. a lot of unique stuff. You guys, you guys mentioned all that, that base station stuff. And I'm actually glad you did because – I just realized uh, when I was testing something, literally after that show, I thought, oh, crap, I, I messed up something here. When I updated the Lime SDR drivers, I kind of hard to, there's a, there's an, there's a, basically another package that runs the, uh, runs what's needed to interface with the SDR to start the BTS. And when I reinstalled it, I removed the package version. Well, the package version puts it in user bin, you know, whatever. And when I compiled it myself, it then went into user local bin. Yeah. And I didn't pick up on that uh, until you guys said something. And then I went checking something. I thought, oh, wow. So I li- before this show, as I'm frantically looking for my RTL SDR version 4, I was also 
building a package, which I just put up on the PPA. Hopefully I didn't break anything since I went so quick, but I put a PPA up there that is that package again with the binaries also in the user local bin. So I think I think that was a, a, a quick solution. Um, I'll have to check it later after the show. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> I'll definitely have to look into that. So we've, we've, been, uh, we've been kind of talking a lot about Dragon OS and we've been mentioning a lot of RTLSDR Four, version 4, the new dongle, well, at least a temporary new dongle is out, at least from most of the documentation I can find. This is sort of a, a temporary solution. Would you agree with that to like a supply issue? But it's also an interesting sort of gap that they're filling with this particular product because it's slightly, that's a, it's a slightly different architecture than the original RTL SDR version 3. Um, which uh, uh, many, I guess, many users that were listeners uh, know that you have to do some weird stuff to get it to receive HF. And uh, it pretty much works out of the box uh, in most systems. Uh, so a few systems you have to go and try to get the drivers and then get the UDEV rules and stuff like that on it, but uh, not so much, uh, not so much any more on the modern modern systems. But uh, so what's your take on this uh, this new new $30 RTL SDR. Uh, yeah. So I, I think I had, well, I read the, the article on the blog. And so the, you know, the individual, uh, that runs, uh, that blog, uh, blog, Carl, uh, I have communicated over the years as well. And, uh, I said, Hey, uh, I would like to, um, build, you know, make sure that I have proper support built into dragon OS and, it was next thing I know. I get three RTL SDR version four showing up um, from 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 him, and I thought, wow, that that was like super nice. And uh, so I built the uh, Osmocom. Well, I built his uh, particular uh, fork first, uh, and then he got. Um, I guess he got his changes pulled into the Osmocom RTL SDR main repo. And so there was some changes there. And without that, so, you know, the nor- the person that's running the normal, you know, 22.04 with an app install of RTL SDR, lib RTL SDR, that version four is not going to work. It's just not, it's not going to, it's not going to recognize it. Um, right. Or actually, let me take that back. I think it may start, but you get like nothing like the, the you could you braise the gain all day long. So it's just not going to work right. So I used the PPA uh, that I had mentioned earlier, pushed that out, so and then built it in uh, the support by default. So anyone that's running DragonOS, I do need to fix the Pi version still. Um, some things about it, though, uh, let me think. So once I built that, then most of the applications in DragonOS were okay. The only one that I point out that that's not, that if you look in the tickets, I kind of raised something there and, and hope that that will be corrected soon. But... SDR trunk. I think maybe you guys even mentioned it. Uh, listening for uh, to trunk radios takes a different approach and has its own Java or whatever it is built. You know files and unfortunately, um, as it stands right now, uh, the the V4 is not recognized. But for everything else, it's um, it's been great. I've not had an issue. It's got uh, pretty handy. I'm looking at it right now. It's uh, got a pretty handy when you turn the bias T on. So like an SDR plus plus, if you flip the bias T on, I heard you mention that it actually has a little red light. So, you know, the thing, you know, well, you hope that it's on. I mean, the red lights there. So that should mean that it's on. Uh, what else? I can't think of anything. I know the frequency, like sensitivity and, and whatever is a different. I, I'm kind of blanking on anything else at the moment that's uh, unique. Maybe if you say something, it might prompt something, but that's kind of um what i can think of at the moment yeah i i just want to go back to your you said you have the uh, the drivers updated for dragon os for that in the ppa now does that support both the three and the four at once oh yeah good point yeah yeah i've not had an issue running both at the same time um you do see that uh, like if you start something uh command line prompt and mm. and you have the v4 uh, plugged in it will kind of call it out you need you like it will say, "Hey, V4, you know, version four detected." So I thought that was pretty handy. But yeah, I've, uh, you know what? Actually, now that you said that, I might as well, probably should check that. I have a maybe I didn't check that. I have an RTL SDR v, version three and a version four right here. So uh, yeah, maybe I, should, <laughs> maybe I should give that a try. <laughs> Some live testing here, yeah, because I uh, I did it the based on the GitHub instructions, you know, which is basically ripping out your old packages. Because I had an install of uh, Pop OS that I was like, oh, I'll just break this and make it only work with the V4. And uh, 
I was able to get it sort of sort of working. That my first stumbling block was the fact that I I didn't have my user in the plug dev group. Oh, okay, yeah. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, that wasn't uh, that wasn't required before. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's just interesting. Why I can't even run you know RTL test and stuff like that. And I actually posted a thing on, on, on Reddit just to see if somebody had an answer for me. And then I ended up finding the other answer because I was like, oh, um, I actually should actually read the full error message because <laughs> it's a, definitely a permissions issue. Uh, and then I looked at the UDEV files and I'm like, oh, it's a totally different group. I'm not in that group. Let me, uh, let me add myself to that group. And then I, it was, it's, it ran sort of fine. I think SDR plus plus still doesn't quite like it in my install um and i am running the nightly build on that so i'm not sure what's not working right with that um but i haven't run like i haven't run on dragon os um this was just a build i was going to break and then i you know got up on gqrx and and you know click the uh you know ignore frequency something or another there's like a like, checkbox now for this particular device so it uh, can just tune wherever it wants oh yeah mm-hmm yeah, so, uh, and I think that's, well, hopefully that'll come out or they'll fix whatever they need to have in every other app, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, well it's because yeah. of spoofiness, right? Well, now you got me. So I plugged in both. RTL uh, test sees both uh, just fine. So that that's a good sign. And oh, yeah. uh, I do have SDR plus plus running one of one of them. Let me stop it. I have it running one of them, but now you got me. I don't want to get caught on this because then I'll, I'll go down this rabbit hole on live show here. But I can see I can see in the drop down two RTL SDRs, but they're both. I don't know. I have to see if like you can actually use them both. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. I even tried to turn it. I turned it on to using um, RTL TCP, which looked like it was working because as soon as I'd click a button in SDR plus plus, I could see the you know notification message and stuff like that of it changing frequencies, changing gain and stuff like that. But I just was not getting any feedback in the application from it. I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'm not using this for right now. But uh, but again, that was on Pop! OS and my little you know, bastardized installation. So <laughs> it's my well, only odd, oddball computer here. And I'll, I'll add to it, so I, I can verify that uh, I did have to the Soapy plugin in SDR plus plus. That's another thing with Dragon OS. I'll just mention um, if you're ever running the Hacker F and you open SDR plus plus, you should go down left hand side, go all the way down to the module manager, and just get rid of the Soapy source because it will. If you try, if that Soapy source is there and the, and the developer explained an issue with the something with the hacker, I can't remember exactly, but basically get rid of that. Because if you try and select the hacker F as a source, it'll just poof, it'll just exit out. But in this case, I had, I opened up two instances of SDR plus plus, and in each one, I can't really tell which SDR is which because uh, they they both say the same thing: generic RTL twenty eight thirty two U. But I am using both on completely different center frequencies, so I know in fact I'm using okay. both the V three and the V four at the same time. So. Well, I'm just going to have to install the proper OS on that machine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I can play with it. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah, the uh, I've, I've noticed like yeah the the HF performance on it is slightly better for sure. Uh, the noise level seems a little bit um, lower in the HF spectrum, uh, probably due to the the change of the uh, key component, and uh, I think they've added some filtering and stuff like that in there as well. So. So yeah, I think it's definitely a more solid product for people wanting to get on HF. But uh, obviously, after this discussion, you know, make sure you're running Dragon OS, <laughs> so you there can you have go. the best of both worlds, right? <laughs> yeah, and like to your point about it, it did mention that I think it was mainly due to like supplies or the chipset maybe not being made anymore is why it it may not be a like a long term solution. It sounded like. Yeah, that's the gist I got from the message. It was like, you know, yeah, the other one was uh, not available, or if it was available, it was way too egregiously priced. Um, and then they were able to kind of come up with this little gap measure. And they definitely mentioned it was not going to be like this won't be around for a long period. This won't be a long production run. Um, at least that's the gist of, of the blog post was. Um, so I, I don't know, like if there's going to be a version five out probably sometime in the next few years, um, I wouldn't doubt it. So great. Uh, Russ, bring you back in here. And I know I've been, we've been chatting a lot about random stuff here. So uh, have you got any uh, questions or comments you want to uh, 
you want to ask? Well, I, I don't have anything for myself, but there have been a couple of uh, questions and uh, suggestions in the chat. And uh, Darren wanted to know if you could add VNC. Did You said something about VNC for the Pi version, right? That was included? I Yeah, the Pi does. I just never, I was, I don't know, I was really concerned with the, de- I, I tried to add the desktop in such a way where, you know, there's nothing that, like basically it would be on the end user to like put, you know, SSH and all that on. So I didn't like leave any like open vulnerability or something. I was just paranoid about that. Okay. I mean, is the, is a VNC server on there or just a client? There is, now that I think about it on the desktop there, <laughs> there is neither. Uh, I've always, I try different things. Uh, you know, VNC does work. I, that's how I typically do all my recordings. I'll just go and add the VNC server real quick. Uh, but if you want audio for free, um, you could you could check out uh, Rust Rust Desk. Um, you can even set it up your own Rust Desk server. It's almost like a, a oh gosh, Team Viewer. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 One. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were actually just talking about that the other uh, some some episode not too long ago. We were talking about uh, virtual virtual uh, machines. It's probably on our uh, not virtual machines, but virtual desktops. We were talking about the uh, how RDP sometimes does or doesn't work, and then VNC is yeah yeah yeah. I think we're going to do a future episode <laughs> on on various <laughs> options in that space, like Team Viewer and No Machine and and Rust Desk and all that stuff. So yeah, um, Darren also says he'd love to see Node Red included. Oh yeah, that I need to get smart on that. I know that the ball geek that I mentioned earlier uh, uses a lot of uh, Node Red, and I, I hear it talked about a lot. I have to, uh, I have to check that out. I, I am. I should point out. I think I had heard you mention this in the last show. I'm kind of, I'm at a point. The way that I make the uh, ISO and the, and the compression that goes in it and everything else. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm at about a limit of uh, about four gigs. That once it's compressed, if I go over that, I my current technique, I, I really can't make the ISO. So it is hard to continue to add, um, you know, more and more. I'm, I'm having to figure out ways around that, maybe like post install or things like that. But I'll definitely see if I could do something with uh, Node Red. All right, and there was another question um, from the <laughs> person that I'm going to try and say from uh, Snusake. Uh, he wanted to know if all the stuff on there was done as snaps or if it's it's I kind of gather you you just build from source or you do the regular um, binary packages from the PPA. You don't you don't build as snaps, right? Uh, no, that, that's uh, funny. The, the snap was like the first thing that I blew away on the Ubuntu and saved me about another two gigs uh, <laughs> worth of space. <laughs> So, so uh, yeah, I, I quickly researched how to get rid of Snap, and you know, the, you know, Firefox is, is from the a, a repo or something like that. But yeah, to answer his question or his or her, you know, question is, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of it is these random uh, repositories that you find out there on the internet that you got to follow, you know, eighteen different steps to to compile. So I'll compile it manually. I've tried to be better about you know using like check install or whatever, you know, with my knowledge of building something into a deb package and uh, putting that in there. There's some things that do, uh, you know, obviously do come from the 22.04 repo. And, and then I just take all this time trying to, you know, make it all work uh, together. It might not be the prettiest thing, uh, but, but I find that it works. So um, I've been doing okay so far, I guess. All right. Good deal. Yeah. I, I personally don't have anything else. I've been following along pretty good and I haven't, you know, had the chance to pick up a version four yet. So I'm looking forward for the opportunity to do that, and then uh, I'm going to have uh, I've got another machine here, and I want to I want to do this on the Pi because I want to I want to get my sort of SDR installation sort of wrapped around the Pi instance, and this seems like a good way to go. So as soon as I get the new SDR, I'm going to plug a couple of them into my Pi four and see what happens. But that's uh, that's all I got. So I'm going to send it back to Bill. Cool. Cool. Well, uh, I think we have kind of run the whole gamut of my notes uh, of things to talk about. So this is the part where we come back to you and say, uh, what would you, what else would you like to talk about that we haven't mentioned, um, whether that be about Dragon OS, RTLs, or anything um, that we can share? Oh, boy. Uh, 
I would just say that the RTL SDR uh, community and the you know the blog uh, have really been supportive of the project over uh, essentially the whole time um, from you know providing uh, version three dongles. Uh, I mean, I can turn around here and I'm looking at two uh, uh, yeah two Kraken SDRs or I'm yeah Kraken SDRs and a, an antenna array. You know, all the way back to the Kerberos SDR. I don't know if you guys ever had one of those, but um, yeah, I think that, um, like, I'm just going to say, you know, if you're getting into SDRs and you want, you know, something like um, low cost, a low, you know, low entry into it, I would say the RTL SDR is um, pretty crazy with all the things uh, the community has built around it. I mean, everything from, you know, there's plugins uh, in Kismet uh, to look at uh, tire sensors, you know, ADSB aircraft. Um, you can look at Iridium with it. Um, you know, anything as long as it's what, like about one point something gigahertz down. It's kind of free game, uh, or so it seems. Uh, other than that, I, I mean, I'll just say I'll, I'll, I'll keep trying, you know, to continue things with Dragon OS. Uh, I know you mentioned now you got me uh, going to be going and searching when, when the next LTS is because I'm thinking, oh, gosh, I, I hope it's like more like a year away. So I don't have to like... Redo April. everything. April, oh. April 24, so. <laughs> oh, you just ru- ruined my night. <laughs> it's always April. Yeah. So, yeah, I, this the 22.04 took me a little while to, to make that jump. I mean, 22.04, I think, is still, you know, supported for some time. So moving to the next LTS, I'm really curious, um, you know, if that's going to change uh, – like the QT version or things like that. Like how long is it going to take all these uh, open source applications that are built upon like say QT fire or whatever, like how long is that going to take to transition? So, you know, maybe I'll stick with 20.04 a little longer than, than I normally would have just because, uh, you know, all these applications like, well, like if you go back to, it seemed like everything moved so far forward, like during, you know, like when people were kind of just indoors all the time, I was seeing a lot of development, you know, now people, you know, open source people were, you know, maybe back to work, but, you know, busy with other things and it doesn't seem like, you know, things move as fast as they did there for a while. So maybe I'll be on 22.04 a little longer. I, d- I did actually think of something that I wanted to ask. Uh, how uh, or what's set up in uh, Dragon OS for like web SDR for uh, accessing your SDRs remotely? Oh, uh, um, well, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Shiny SDR is kind of old, and and uh, but it is in there still uh, chugging along. I think I I think Shiny SDR is like a web based thing. Uh, wow, um, I mean. I, well, maybe not necessarily web-based, but, you know, a lot of those uh, Sig Digger, SDR++, uh, even SDR Angel have, like, remote side aspects to it. So, I mean, you you could reach it over it, but I, don't, I think that's a little different than what you're asking. Um, he actually has Open WebRx installed on there, though. Oh, yeah. Thanks, <laughs> duh. Yeah, that's, a, <laughs> that's in there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> All right, Bill, can you tell me a little bit more about Dragon OS? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he's got so many darn programs in here. Oh, my God. I, I can surprise you can remember any of them. <laughs> it was like we were going through here like, what the heck is this for? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I get so many in there. And then I, another thing I just learned recently, I'm like, I'm, I, I was trying to uh, demo at the end of that video about that NRIC5. You might have caught me or may, maybe I cut it out, but I was trying to think of something that I could uh, demonstrate with that uh, epic Pluto SDR in there. And I, my fallback was going to be, oh, I'll show um, Retrogram. Uh, mm-hmm. Retrogram has a Pluto SDR thing. I started typing in the, you know, in the terminal there. I'm like, where did it go? Where did it go? And sh- <laughs> sure enough, I had made sim links to Retrogram Pluto SDR, Retrogram SOPI SDR, and Retrogram RTL SDR. And all those sim links went to the user source directory where I had left the source or the source files. And for some reason, I accidentally deleted all those when I made the new I- ISO. And I thought, well, great. Now, uh, now I'm going to have to make a PPA for that to put the, put the things back in there. So, yeah. 
That's funny. Um, yeah, speaking of the, the uh, Pluto, the Pluto actually transmits. So, what other like uh, like what other SDRs would you recommend? I mean, you don't have to recommend anything, but like if someone wanted to get into like doing some some transmitting side, yeah. I mean, the RTL SDR is obviously a receive only uh, tool. But if somebody wanted to get into like even even like non licensed transmitting, kind of like what what you're doing, and, you know, more experimenter stuff, uh, what would you recommend them kind of maybe start? with if you just want like half like you know duplex the you know the hacker f is great uh you know for a lot of things if you want to get into like you know full duplex and being able to do you know the gsm lte those type of things i'm looking around here i've got a blade rf uh give them a shout out they sent me a real nice aluminum case actually they donated the blade rf to me a uh, blade rf xa9 uh uh, another one, um, actually some pretty unique ones. I, yeah, I purchased the E310, the Ant SDR E310 off of, uh, can't even remember the site, but, uh, the Ant SDR E200 was, uh, you know, sent out to me and that thing's kind of unique because it can run uh, Pluto SDR like firmware. And it can also, it's also supported in Dragon OS. I modified the UHD, uh, which normally would run like your, uh, USRP, your, your Edis, uh, UHD equipment, uh, it can run the Ant SDR E200. And it hmm. makes it, it the, the unique thing is uh, it runs an SD card. And you can actually use, uh, oh gosh, I can get off on a tangent here, but it can run what's called open Wi Fi, which is a um, 80211 um, full transceiver FPGA implementation. And oh, uh, wow. yeah, I literally, um, this is a real side thing, but I, I had the. Uh, I think it run it can run the Raspberry Raspbian whatever a Linux uh, operating system on the SDR itself and uh, no kidding I, I see all these people out there they they run uh, Doom they run the classic Doom on everything you know pregnancy test thing like anything you could possibly think of so I I ran and compiled and ran Chocolate Doom on my SDR with a headless you know connecting to it and uh, getting the video to come across and uh, I thought it was cool but uh, I didn't get to see that much interest, you know. I thought, man, it, how cool is this? <laughs> yeah, that does sound pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, it's got a got a beefy, uh, beefy chip on there. It's got a, a Xilinx. Yeah, it's almost like a. Uh, it can act almost as though it's a uh, E two ten. Like, I mean, spec wise, uh, it only it has a uh, one gigabyte uh, connection to it, Ethernet connection. So, not your USB three and stuff, but. Still pretty cool. I think price wise, you know, might be a little uh, lower uh, entry point. So, yeah, I think that's a few. I'm probably missing. I'm, I'm looking around. You know, there's other there's other transmit uh, SDRs. I just can't think of any at the moment. Yeah, Pluto SDR. That's a good one too. It's not not too pricey. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, um, if there is nothing else that we want to mention, yeah. let's uh, mention to the people where they can find you. Obviously, we mentioned your YouTube channel, but maybe you have some other places that uh, you, people can find you. Uh, yeah, really, just the same name: C M A X E C U T R. Like there, like dot com. I, I'll be honest; I'm not a real good uh, uh, web designer or whatever. So you know, the, the page is very simple; just takes you where you can download things on SourceForge. Uh, whether it's the Pi version, which I, I do need to update, or the desktop version, or my little store where the War Dragon is, I'm just kind of experimenting with that. And then, and then, yeah, really YouTube with that same name, and then uh, the the old X uh, X dot com Twitter Twitter dot com handle. That's pretty much it, I think. Well, great. Well, we really appreciate you, Aaron, uh, coming on yep. here and and straightening us up with the uh, Dragon OS and and teaching us a little bit about it and uh, and uh, talking about your experience with the uh, the RTL SDR4 and uh, all the possibilities that are out there using uh, your SDR for various applications through your uh, uh, your very educational YouTube channel on uh, on that topic. So I really uh, I really appreciate you coming on such a short notice and, and and answering my email just out of a random blue, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I I appreciate it. It's been fun. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, definitely, it's definitely my first podcast. So. Uh, maybe I have to check these. Uh, obviously, check these out more often. R very uh, informative. What you guys are doing on here too. 
Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to go through and uh, do our announcements and feedback and stuff like that. So uh, you're welcome to hang out and listen or or you can drop out. It's all it's all up to you at this point. But uh, thank you again for uh, for being a guest. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You, very much. thank you. You guys take care and uh, have a good evening. Yeah, yeah you, you too. Okay. All right. Well, Bill, you've got an announcement, so you might as well just roll right into it. Yeah, it's an announcement. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'll be at uh, Linux Fest Northwest in October. Uh, it's, it runs October twentieth to twenty second. It's up in uh, Bellingham, Washington, just north of Seattle. Uh, it's run by the Jupiter Broadcast guys. It's up there at the Bellingham Technical College. It's a great, great location. It's a free event. So uh, uh, if you're up that way and happen to be close by, and you're there in October. Please stop by and uh, see it. it. You don't even have to come see me. It's fine. It's fine. I I will just be talking about the same thing you hear every night that we talk about Linux and the Ham Shack. I will just be doing it with a bunch of Linux people. So uh, yeah, yeah, come out, uh, come out and see me, or uh, come out to Linux Fest Northwest. All right, very good. So let me get to the new subscribers, supporters, and live participants. We can wrap this one up and enjoy the rest of our evenings. So for new subscribers and Patreons, we have the Penguin Rockers, which I'm definitely going to have to find out more about that group, because <laughs> that sounds awesome. On Facebook, we uh, have Arthur Bryant, James Merritt, Larry Lane, Ahmad Aholi, Lori Tabajarvi, and Owen Vernon. Nobody on X. On YouTube, Alex Starr. On Discord, Ryan. KE0SHV-Logan. Snusake. Wandering Andy. Gionle. Or something like that. Just a random group of characters. Um, and AWD Mesh hashtag and SEMA Executor, which I think may be the same person. That's the same person, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that was Aaron. So, Just But he's on our good card now. We have him forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on Mastodon, we had uh, VE3RWJ at Sandwich and at K8CTR. No merch sales. Samuel Miller joined the mailing list. And live tonight, we had John K1BTZ. Tony N0WJE, Darren VK60K, Snusake, Ted WA0EIR, Jim 7J1AJH, and Stacy KB7YS. So that actually brings us down to the end of the show. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up here and say thanks for listening. Thanks for being a subscriber and uh, downloading the show. We really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll hear you all on the next one, or you'll hear us on the next one. And maybe we'll hear from you too. So this has been episode number 516 of Linux in the Ham Shack for the on assignment, hopefully not forever, Cheryl, W5MOO. I'm Russ, K5TUX. And I'm Bill, NE4RD73. Thank you for listening to this episode of Linux in the Ham Shack. LHS is a community-sponsored podcast. Our website is located at lhspodcast.info. You can support the podcast by visiting the LHS Patreon page at patreon.com stroke LHS podcast or by using the contribute list on the homepage. We have a presence on Discord, Facebook, IRC, Twitter and YouTube. You can also drop us an email at info at lhspodcast.info or leave us a voicemail at one nine zero nine. NHS show. That's 1-909-547-7469. Visit the online LHS merchandise store at shop.lhspodcast.info for fun and fashionable show themed merchandise. Until next time, remember to always heed your hedonism.